Well, the good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to you all, zooming in from Southern California, the Bay Area, New York, and many other locations. I'm Mary White, co chair, co director of Weed, joined with Weed co founder and magazine editor Susan Liebert Steinman, Weed secretary and art and activism founder Christina Bertia, Weed vice director Sharon Sisson. So please wave to say hi to our audience. Hi, everybody. Um, Women Equal Art Dialogue, founded in 1996, is a volunteer run collective of female identified visual artists, writers, curators, art historians, researchers, scientists, and others interested in highlighting the intersection of art and ecological issues. Thank you for coming to this very special event to honor and celebrate artist, activist, educator, Sant Kalsak. We'll start with the land acknowledgement. And if you wish, please add your location and land acknowledgement in the chat. Reed's office sits on the territory of the Wichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichonyo speaking Maloney people, the successors of the sovereign Verona, Verona tribe of Alameda County. And we're right next to one of the largest shell mounds in the Bay Area. The land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mui Ma. Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona band. We recognize the Muwikma Ohlone tribe who are campaigning to become federally recognized, the association of Ramushtuch Ohlone who are researching, revitalizing and preserving the Metush Ohlone history and culture, and the confederated Villages of Lejeune and the Sogorate Land Trust, who are working to return native land back to the indigenous stewardship, including a little garden that got just returned this year in Berkeley. Um, a little Zoom housekeeping. We are recording this presentation. Please keep your audio muted during the presentation. The hostess and co hosts may mute you if there's extra noise. Sant's presentation will go on. Approximately she said 7.45, uh, 45 minutes, but take as long as you need, up to an hour. And after you finish, after Sant's finished speaking, we'll stop the first recording and start the second recording for questions and answers. If you have questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat and we'll try to address them in the second section, the second recording. Weed's vision is to continue for another decade. Decade is our global network of women activists, artists grows. We just started as of this beginning of this month, a three to four month project of rebuilding our 2012 website into a new version with new tools for the artist directory and membership interaction. Please give generously to support this vision either by visiting the donate button on our website or sending a check, which is in the listing. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Susan Liebowitz Steinman, who's going to introduce Sant. And I just like to say that um, Susan selected Sant's photograph in issue six of the Weed magazine, Dirty Waters as the cover poster. So check out the uh, six, issue six of the time. magazine. Okay, Susan, take it away. Okay, you probably can't see me because I'm busy looking at the text, but welcome Sant. Sant um, has been a friend of Weed for many, many, many years. I remember a couple of exhibits that she was in in the early two zero zero zero. I don't know how you say that, 20, 20s? I don't know what that is. Anyways, she is an eco-feminist artist, curator, and activist, and she's going to share the evolution of her integrated art life practice, which develops a mindful inquiry into complex environmental issues. Her artworks create a contempl contemplative space where one can sense the subtle and profound connections between themselves, the natural world, and our constructed landscapes. She'll discuss a number of her significant art and activism works, including her 20 plus year Paving Paradise, which is a really important project, photographic project, 
on the Santa Ana River and watershed, the largest coastal water system in Southern California. Western waters photographs and installations about the commodification of water, photo-based works and installations on our interdependent relationship with trees and forests begun with her planting a forest in 1992 and her current curatorial research for the 2024 exhibition and book, The Survival of the Joshua Tree. Integral to her art and activism is in deep subject research, collaboration with scientists and engagement with nonprofits and diverse communities. Um, her artwork is internationally exhibited, published and acquired by museums. I don't think that I need to do all the, I'm not gonna li list them all, Son, if you'll forgive me. She curates and moderates the monthly Eco Art Space Zoom program, Tree Talk, Artists Speak for Trees, and this is important, her forthcoming second monograph, Crystal Clear Western Waters, being published by Minor Matters Books, features 60 of her photographs of retail water stores across the Southwestern US and a short essay by artist Ed Rushka. She is professor of art emeritus, emeritus at CSU San Bernardino and resides in Joshua Tree, California, where she established the Joshua Tree Center for Photographic Arts. She is um, a very rounded person, dedicated to her research, dedicated to protecting what she can protect, especially since she lives in such a sensitive area like Joshua Tree. So I'm going to let Sant go ahead and, um, and tell her story herself. And please stick around afterwards and ask some questions um, about her and about her work and about her life. Thank you. Thank go you, ahead, Susan. Sant. Thank you. It's so wonderful to see you and uh, everyone today. And uh, I appreciate the invitation uh, to join um, the group today for art and activism. Um, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. So let's try that and make sure all is working. Okay. Does that look good? It looks beautiful. Great, okay. Um, I am Sant Khalsa coming to you from my studio in Joshua Tree, grateful and humble to live on the ancestral land of the Serrano, Chimueve, Mojave, and Cahuilla people. My talk is of a personal nature, actually also of a political nature. At this moment, I, like many of you, are doing my best to cope with the Supreme Court abortion decision. The overturning of Roe v. Wade not only rescinds women's rights, but sends a clear message that personal freedoms are at risk. Our voice and vote are the power we still have to protect human rights and the natural world. Art and activism are powerful tools for expressing our ideas and actions moving forward for social and environmental justice. It is a gift to spend this time with all of you when I am feeling anger, sadness, a bit of rage, and I would much rather focus my energy on art, nature, beauty, and hope. Not moving forward here, give me a second. Tonight, I will share my experiences, my intimate relationship with nature and evolution of my ideas, art and activism with you. I will share a number of photographic projects and sculptural works produced over four decades. I welcome your questions and discussion at the end of my presentation. Feel free to put questions and comments in the chat. 
As a youngster, I never thought I would leave New York City where I was born and raised. Certainly didn't imagine that my life's journey would bring me to San Bernardino and more recently to Joshua Tree. I'm an artist and activist as well as an educator and curator that views art as a powerful tool for raising human consciousness. I agree with the artist Joseph Boys, who said, quote, I think art is the only political power, the only ev revolutionary power, the only evolutionary power, the only power to free humankind from all repressions. I use photography as a tool for researching my relationship with the world. Art is a process for exploring my ideas and what I am most passionate about. For me, art is both personal and political. That's a picture of me when I'm about 19, I think. I, ex I use photography, uh, excuse me. I experience and see life through the lens of an artist and believe I've always been that way. I began photographing in 1971 while a painting major at the Maryland Institute College of Art as a means to document societal issues and a tool for self-reflection and discovery. My earliest photographs were portraits and self-portraits in an attempt to know myself, raise women's consciousness and understand human nature. It was a period of societal stress and change and I was immersed in the dialogue through both political action and my art practice. My work took a new direction when I relocated to California in 1975. I landed in San Bernardino on the periphery of desert and mountain lands, a landscape in transition due to population growth and suburban sprawl. The landscape I encountered was antithetical to the iconic images of the American West I had seen in Hollywood movies or in 19th century photographs by William Henry Jackson and Timothy O'Sullivan or those taken later by Ansel Adams and Edward Weston. Being a visual artist, I was hypersensitive to the dramatic change in my surroundings and felt displaced. Yet I was intrigued by my new experience of space, light, and territory utterly foreign to me. I began to photograph the landscape as a means of investigating, interpreting, and expressing my experience, vision, and ideas about the place I called home. My new terrain was horizontal, vast, open, and expansive, while my previously known New York environment had been vertical, compressed, controlled, and limited. Photographing had become my meditation and I began to comprehend and adapt to my new environment through the lens of my camera. By the early 1980s, I was fully engaged in my art practice as a landscape photographer, dedicated to a relationship with the place where I lived and depicting the permeable boundaries between the natural world and built environments. Many of my artworks are inspired by, eco by my ecofeminist perspective. For those not familiar with ecofeminism, it is an academic and activist movement that sees critical connections between the domination of nature and the exploitation of women in a patriarchal society. Ecofeminists advocate an alternative worldview that values the earth as sacred, recognizes humanity's dependency on the natural world and embraces all life as equal and valuable. I also seek and respect indigenous knowledge and culture, which embodies a long and continued connection to mother earth, all living beings and spirits. Water and air have been central to my research and creative work. These subjects provide me with endless material for developing ideas and artworks, expressing the myriad of meanings, mythologies, and metaphors, in addition to science associated with these essential life-giving elements. My works are intended to create a contemplative space where one can sense the subtle and profound connections between themselves and the natural world. Photographing is an integral part of my art and meditation practice, being still, alert, and present in a moment of mindful observation, as well as a means to organize and make sense of what I perceive as a chaotic, conflicted, and complex world. 
Additionally, I create installations, sculptural and performative works with the intention of engaging my audience as an active participant rather than a passive observer. Many say that I am obsessed with water. I say, how can I not be? I live in the desert. I need water to survive. Water is a scarce natural resource that plays a critical role in the destiny of humanity and all flora and fauna. Water is beautiful, refreshing, and miraculous. We consume water to sustain our lives and immerse ourselves in water to cleanse our body and soul and awaken our spirit. Pure water is the universal solvent, yet polluted, wa polluted water is the carrier of disease and death. Water became a primary subject of my artwork because it serves as a natural conduit between the human body and the water body, planet Earth, a connection between the scientific and the spiritual and that which ultimately determines our survival. Today, water quality and availability are some of the most important issues facing our communities and our planet. Our dependence on natural water sources such as rivers, aquifers, and wells is being tested daily as we cope with the reality of climate change. We search for new innovative solutions to provide water to meet our most basic human requirement. One major focus of my work over more than two decades was the 96 mile long Santa Ana River and Watershed, which is the largest coastal water system in Southern California. It runs through the arid San Bernardino, Riverside and Orange counties and is the lifeline for 5 million residents. I often refer to the Santa Ana River as my river, not to allude to ownership or control, but rather with respect to the intimate relationship one develops over time with a dear friend. The river runs through me and serves as a source of vital sustenance for my body, mind, and creative spirit. The photographs in my river project titled Paving Paradise address complex environmental and societal issues and reflect upon various ideas concerning our relationship with the river and watershed as a place of community, economic resource, recreational site, natural habitat, sanctuary and spiritual refuge. The work also acknowledges the river's power to sustain life as well as for destruction. The sites and subjects have been quite varied and include the run of the river from its headwaters in the San Bernardino National Forest to its culmination in the Pacific and Huntington Beach. The project images depict the river's tributaries nine years of building the Seven Oaks Dam and raising of the Prado Dam, canyons and wetlands, water quality and conservation efforts, and extended periods of drought, vast forest fires, and devastating floods. These images were made over the nine years of building the 550 foot high Seven Oaks flood control dam. I had the privilege of being the only civilian with access to photograph the construction of this massive earth, earthen dam. I witnessed massive earth moving changes to this canyon and learned about our water systems working alongside the Army Corps of Engineers. So I'll show you a few more images from this project. When I first started going to the site, it was this beautiful untouched canyon. And over time, over those nine years, I saw all these changes and it became harder and harder for me to go there and photograph, but at the same time, and, and to see these changes to this place. But at the same time, I really felt that um, working alongside the Army Corps of Engineers was so informative and really gave me a sense of how our political structures relate to water, our institutions relate to water, and, um, and how um, the core related to water, which was in a very, very different way than I did. These, um, these next photographs depict the ongoing cycles of drought, 
fires and floods throughout my three decade long project. So this is actually Big Bear Lake, a very large lake during a period of drought. So these are the some variety of drought images. This was during, during a very large um, bark beetle infestation that happened in the Big Bear area where millions of trees had to be cut down. And of course, there were lots of, of forest fires that occurred as well uh, during this time period. And then within the cycle comes the fires. This is actually an area known as Devil's Canyon right behind Cal State San Bernardino where I taught for many years. And of course, there was a loss of so many um, animals in this region because of fires. And then the floods, that's always that comes next. This is actually a street that became um, an area that people were boating through because there was so much water behind the Prado Dam. And this is on the Santa Ana River between San Bernardino and Redlands. This is Riverside. In addition to exhibiting, I share my work with nonprofits who are working to protect and conserve our precious river and other natural resources within the watershed. I was first drawn to the Santa Ana because of its natural beauty, the vast open landscape, the starkness of its often dry riverbeds and the power of its occasional rushing waters. I spent three decades drawing inspiration and knowledge from this contested landscape. It is an ecosystem that is cherished and protected by some, but consumed and disregarded by most. It continues to undergo changes as much by acts of nature as by human hands. This 16 photo wall installation is titled, A River Runs Through Me. The piece brings together more personal and poetic images to describe my relationship with the river. For this series, I made small gelatin silver photographs of the river, earth, and sky to bring attention to the beauty of ordinary experience and the realization that we are nature. The visual structure of the installation refers to the flow of the river and water and its movement through the land and our bodies. So here's a, a number of uh, images from that um, 16 piece wall installation. This is a photograph behind the Prado Dam. I'm sorry, the, the Seven Oaks Dam. And this is actually behind the Prado Dam. These are part of the Prado wetlands and the dry area of the wetlands. I don't know if you can see there's a frog right in the center of that dry riverbed. <laughs> and this image really shows um, all of the activity that happens um, often in the riverbed because we see the movement of all the bugs and uh, probably the paws of a coyote and the track of a human. This is actually a flooded golf course um, below the Prado Dam and uh, also uh, a flood below the Prado Dam. They had to release water uh, during a time of extreme rain and uh, flood a, a, a small community in order to protect um, all of Orange County if the dam would, would burst. And of course, there's a lot of wildlife um, along the river and through, throughout the watershed. The Santa Ana R River watershed actually has the most diverse population of birds uh, in all of California. Donkey. My extensive photo project on the Santa Ana River 
was informed by personal experiences living most of my life in the watershed, working for nine years alongside the US Army Corps of Engineers while photographing the building of the Seven Oaks Dam, and in my work with the Water Resources Institute at California State University, San Bernardino, where I taught art for 30 years. The WRI Research Institute was founded by myself and colleagues in the natural health and information sciences to research and tackle critical and complex water issues in the inland region of Southern California. Additionally, I was a member of the Water in the West Project, a large scale photographic collaboration addressing water issues in the Western United States. Through the 1990s, I'd worked with an extraordinary group of 11 photographers, including Mark Klett, Terry Evans, Peter Gowen, Robert Dawson, and Laurie Brown, and curator Ellen Manchester, as well as a number of water experts investigating a wide range of topics related to the use and abuse of water in the American West. We felt that bringing our individual perspectives approaches and regional projects together formed a more in-depth and powerful message. Project exhibitions and publications were educational, the thematic, and issue-centered, as well as art focus. This unique approach and experience expanded my understanding of water and land issues and my visual vocabulary. The Water in the West Photographs and Archives is held at the Center for Creative Photography at the University of Arizona in Tucson and is available for research. Continuing with my focus on water, my two installations titled The Sacred Spring and Watershed are important in understanding evolution of my ideas about our relationship with water. Both installations are conceptual work solely constructed with everyday materials that involve the most basic and necessary of life experiences, the drinking of water. The works are visually minimal, visually minimal while offering complex layers of meaning for the audience to consider through their active participation in the art experience. The sacred spring serves as a metaphor for nature and self, as well as a site for consumption of what already exists and flows within each of each one of us. This piece developed from my practice of yoga and meditation, travels to sacred water sites in India, and the myth of the nine muses born from a sacred spring to inspire. Nine spigots provide water as a conduit for the receiving of inspiration, abundance, creativity, affection, honesty, intuition, harmony, passion, and grace. All are invited to drink from the spring. My watershed installation further developed my ideas from the sacred spring by creating a bottled water company whose product plays on the notion that we consume to feel better about ourselves and gives the consumer what they physically require and psychologically desire. The artworks address the commodification of nature, water as consumer product, and human desire, a never ending thirst. Watershed is intended to use what is familiar to bring about a turning point in the course of one's own experience and understanding of our inherent relationship with water and the natural world, a watershed moment. Each bottle of drinkable spring water in box is located, is labeled with the product names that represent attributes found in the natural world, as well as desirable human qualities for consumption. The idea for my photographic project, Western Waters, developed while I was researching the bottled water industry for my installation, Watershed. I'm gonna take a little drink here. In 1999, while web browsing the word watershed, I found a business named Watershed, located in Palmdale, California. Of course, I was curious, so I got in my car and drove to the Western Mojave Desert to see what this business was. There I found a retail water store in a strip mall selling reverse osmosis purified water from tap to bottle. Further inquiry and research led to my awareness of this growing business of retail water stores throughout the Southwest. 
I was drawn to the subject because of the apparent necessity yet absurdity of these stores and the way these venues seek to represent the source of a natural experience. Of course, these stores are merely an entrepreneurial enterprise, a constructed site to provide the consumer with the most essential requirement for life and survival. Plastic bottles have replaced earthen vessels and polluting automobiles carry us to and from this fabricated representation of a river, a well, or spring to fetch our water. I use the internet yellow pages to locate stores in Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern Nevada. I was especially intrigued by the store names and how they referred to natural water sites, water quality, and spiritual aspects related to water. For exam example, here is heaven, the Heavenly Water Store. It appears that the concepts in my two installation works, the Sacred Spring and Watershed, had manifested themselves in the real world. I decided to use a photographic strategy atypical to my personal photographic style to present the subject content in a more objective way. My approach was influenced by the work of several artists and photographers that I have long admired and have had a, and have had a significant impact on contemporary photography. I considered the social documentary photographs of Walker Evans. His approach to storefronts and signage seemed perfect for my project. Also, the photo book projects of Ed Ruscha which used a straightforward, even deadpan, anti-aesthetic depiction of his subjects. I was specifically thinking about 60 water stores in a similar way to 26 gasoline stations. And of course, the typology photo works of Bernard and Hiller Becker, or Becher, considering their gas tanks as they related to Ed Ruscha's gasoline stations and more specifically, their water tanks as they would relate to my photographs of water stores. To create Western waters, I went on pilgrimages to these water sites, numerous road trips across four states over a period of several years, never knowing what I would find when I arrived at the location. Each store location provided some commonalities, but each also provided a unique experience. Ironically, this was similar to the experience that I had wandering in India in the early 80s, seeking holy and healing water sites, but often just finding a spigot and a sign marking the site. Western Waters again establishes a framework for understanding how we view the natural world, especially water as commodity. The stores attempt to give the consumer health and happiness as seen in store names such as Pure Water and Happy Water. The success of these stores is based on consumer fear that their tap water is not safe to drink and providing a less expensive alternative to bottled water. Water stores are generally located in low-income neighborhoods, areas with large immigrant populations, retirement communities, or in regions where tap water has a very high mineral content. I photographed nearly 200 of these stores. Uh, here are a few more. These 60 frame gelatin silver prints were installed in a pattern which refers to the geography and mapping related to where the stores are situated in four states and in relation to each other in my road trip experience. 20 years ago, I wrote, quote, the Western waters photographs will serve in the future as a historical document of either a fleeting fad or the foundation of what will become commonplace in our society. Today, the, the many complex today, the many complex issues raised by my photographs of retail water stores remain critically important 
as we face climate change, water scarcity in the West, and water quality issues throughout the US due to failing water infrastructures and industrial and agricultural pollution. I am honored that Minor Matter Books reached out to me about publishing a monograph of the 60 photographs under the title, Crystal Clear Western Waters, and that artist Ed Ruscha, who inspired my approach to the work, agreed to contribute a short essay to the book. Minor Matters employs a wonderful community model for their books, mostly of underrepresented, underrepresented photo-based artists, including women and BIPOC artists, which requires that books be pre-ordered before the book is published. My deadline for, uh, for a goal of 400 books is in two days. I'm happy to say that I'm 46 books from reaching that goal. And I feel very sure that um, I will meet that goal and the book will be published. If you're interested, you can purchase a book over the next two days. And what's so wonderful is that you will be listed in the book as a co-publisher because that's how this process works. And you can just go to mindandmatterbooks.com. My little plug for the book. Um, this next photographic project was made while I was working on Western, the Western Waters photographs. It was a collaboration with B.H. Fairchild, a preeminent poet who often writes about his experience of place. Both my photographs and Fairchild's writings in the project title, The Death of the Heart, depict, interprets, and gives aesthetic presence to the slow death of rural small towns throughout the contemporary Midwest. Owing to corporate farming and the plight of the small farmer, the proliferation and strategies of big box stores, the interstate freeway system, and the ongoing migration of rural populations into urban and suburban, suburban spaces, a ghost town phenomena swept through the farm states. The loss is not only economic, but cultural, and the causes are very complex. These images were made while I journeyed in West Kansas in 2002, traveling 1170 miles on backcountry roads to several dozen farm towns with populations of 100 or less, some as few as five people. Yet in the past, Thousands and ten thousands of people lived in these towns. I photographed the sparse yet historically and visually rich remains of these towns and the surrounding landscapes. The images speak of memories deeply planted in these places, provide critical and creative insight, and capture this astonishing historical event to reveal and preserve it. The photographs represent my experience of these extraordinarily ordinary places and record the evidence of change, loss, and absence. Unlike most of my photographs, which are typically made close to home in Southern California and the Southwest, these photographs are about the power and reclamation of nature in what were once populated spaces rather than the destruction of natural sites through human uh, inhabitation. These are several more images from the Death of the Heart series. This is a, a very large um, public school that's totally abandoned. Lots of grain, you know, there's grain mills all through uh, Western Kansas. Lots of towns are boarded up. Main streets are grown over. The collaboration is incomplete without the words of B.H. Fairchild. I will, will read one of his short poems titled, The Death of a Small Town. It's rather like snow in the beginning, immaculate, brilliant, 
the trees shocked into a crystalline awareness of something remarkable, like them, but not of them, perfectly formed, yet formless. You want to walk up and down in it, this bleak, mazeless field of innocence with its black twigs and blue leaves. You want to feel the silence crunching beneath your house shoes, but soon everyone is wallowing in it. The trees no longer bear sunlight. The sky has dragged down its gray dream. And now it's no longer snow, but something else, not water or even its dumb cousin mud, but something used, ordinary, dull. Then one morning at 4 a.m., you go out seeking that one feeble remnant. You are so lonely. And of course you find its absence. An odd thing to come upon an absence, to come upon a death, to come upon what is left when everything is gone. Such a powerful thought and image. Quote, what is left when everything is gone? Something I think about every day. The realization that climate change is impacting every living species on our planet, including us. That human acts of greed and negligence had led to the extinction of hundreds of animals and plant species and endangers thousands more. As an individual artist and activist, I consider that my very action can contribute to the problem or help towards solution. I strive to live a mindful and compassionate life in harmony with the natural world, which is both a challenge and a gift. Returning to the evolution of my art as activism, let's look back to the late 1980s and 1990s when I produced a series of works titled Distress Signals. Distress Signals integrates signs and symbols, including Morse code, which is the only international language for distress. Ironically, Samuel Morse, the inventor of Morse code, was also a scenic landscape painter and one of the original inventors of photography. My project seems like it seemed like a natural way to fuse these historical references into contemporary works that speak about critical environmental issues. This piece that you're seeing, Tidal Air, is an example from my early distress signal works using Morse code to bring attention to the critical importance of our symbiotic relationship with trees. The symbols spell the word trees, the, I'm sorry, the word air. In a series of meditation altars, warning symbols are transformed into altar pieces picturing devastated landscapes. Here's one example. In 1992, I was invited to produce new work for the thematic exhibition, Smog, A Matter of Life and Breath at the California Museum of Photography at UC Riverside. The Los Angeles Basin and more specifically the inland region of Riverside and San Bernardino have long suffered from the worst air quality in the US due to a large population and car culture, as well as sunny stagnant weather and a bowl-like topography. The region has the highest level of ozone pollution and second worst for year round particulates in the nation. This was the beginning of my interest and focus on air quality as a subject in my work. Each artist in the smog show was paired with a research scientist at the UCR Air Pollution Research Center. At the first meeting with my collaborating scientist, Dr. Paul Miller, I asked, what was the best thing I could do as an individual to positively impact air quality in the Inland Empire? He said, plant trees. I planted over a thousand native and fire resilient ponderosa pine seedlings as a volunteer with the National Forest Service in Holcomb Valley near Big Bear Lake over many weekends during the 1992 spring planting season. The Holcomb Valley had been environmentally decimated by mining, clear cutting, and cattle grazing during Southern California's 1860s gold rush. 
My planting experiences were physically labor intensive, yet emotionally profound and cognitively transformative, inspiring the creation of the site specific installation, the sacred breath seen here. The sacred breath is a meditation environment which focuses on the interdependence between human beings and trees and provides the participant with an experience of the breath as a life giving, as a life giving gift from trees. In the installation, a lung-shaped photographic altarpiece connects our bodies with forests, the lungs of the earth. On the altar below are ponderous pine seedlings and chemistry flasks filled with earth, air, water, and charcoal for fire. On each side of the altar are suspended prayer wheels which continuously turn. The prayer wheels are covered with photo images of healthy forests. Inside each wheel are texts provided as prayers for trees, plant trees, protect trees, save trees, etc., seen in the previous slide. As in Tibetan belief, each rotation of the wheel is likened to the recitation of the prayer it contains. On a smaller wooden altar sits a handmade prayer book of tree photographs with the words inhale and exhale to guide you through a breath meditation. For the show, I also produced the photo wall installation titled SOS, We Are Killing Trees, Therefore We Are Killing Ourselves, which presents photographs of the most smog damaged trees in the US at the time. The images are printed on square and rectangle panel panels to create a visual statement which spells the international Morse code signal SOS. Many of my subsequent photos, sculptural and installation works related to trees, forest and air quality evolved from my life-changing experience planting a forest. Stand is a sculptural work created for the LACMA Photography Los Angeles Now exhibition in 1995 with my then collaborator, Charles Moorhead. The large work represents a specimen-like replication of a stand of trees and constructed memory of a fire-destroyed forest. High contrast photographic images of trees burned in forest fires are held between glass and inset in wood on a charcoal and steel base. Light moves through the transparent gelatin silver photographs projecting the images on the wall. The work addresses issues representing the representation of reality through the photographic image and its implied memory of the environmental experience. Trees and seedlings are akin to stand in my use of burned forest imagery and materials. The work addresses both the fragility and resilience of nature. Trees and seedlings represent the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth the memory of a forest and the promise of new growth. These pieces vary in height and are grouped and installed leaning against the wall like planks of wood are stored and displayed for purchase in a lumber yard. In 2010, I began a new phase of exploration and transition in my life with the purchase of a home in Joshua Tree, where I now live. I moved to a small town in the Mojave Desert with a desire to seek a life of simplicity with a deeper connection between myself, community, and our natural world. I began to work seriously for the first time with color and a focus on the rural desert environment after a long career of depicting the urban and suburban places where I lived in black and white. The photographs represent my recent reflections on time and place, nature and culture, self and community, and our consumption of natural resources. It is my experience of the vast and beautiful yet complex, fragile and threatened California desert ecosystem. Of course, water and lack of it is a dominant subject in the photographs. These images are from the Salton Sea area with special interest in the geothermal fields and power plants a site being considered by the tech industry as the future lithium valley. So I'll show you these, these images. This is the uh, geothermal fields and power plant where uh, energy is harnessed from the hot water underground. 
I mean, there, it's just an extraordinary place. And the idea of it becoming Lithium Valley is just very, very disheartening. I also have a fascination with Bristol Dry Lake, the ancient desert salt mines near Amboy. I'll show you some of those images. You can see just from looking at these photographs of why I would want to work with color specifically in, in the desert when I've worked in, with black and white all these years. As I mentioned, color is fairly new to my practice and I'm in the process of developing an aesthetic that supports my vision. Though I am interested in working with film and making black and white gelatin silver prints, color seems more su suitable at this time for expressing my ideas about these environments that I'm exploring. My life in the Mojave Desert, the Southern California drought and climate change inspired the work Pray for Rain during an artist residency at Pilchuck Glass School in Washington State. I integrated earlier ideas from distress signals to create a glass kinetic sculpture inspired by the concept design and technology of the Tibetan prayer wheel. Pray for Rain is intended to emote a message of emergency and distress, a focused plea for water. It is, a constru it is constructed from a 17 inch high clear blown glass cylinder that is half full or half empty with water and embossed with the Morse code symbols for the word water. Messages in small bottles float in the water, each containing a word associated with water, such as snow, ice, drop, cloud, and flow. The clear prayer wheel is capped with a blue blown glass sphere, which represents our planet, which is mostly water. The projection and reflection of the glass water bottles and light on the wall produce a pattern similar to the wave seen on a body of water, such as the ocean. The prayer wheel appears to be mysteriously turning. This is done by setting it upon a motorized pedestal, which continuously turns clockwise. In spring 2018, I had a large solo exhibition titled Prana, Life with Trees at the Museum of Art and History in Lancaster, California. A book of the same title was released in 2019 by Moa and Griffith Moon Publishing. All of my proceeds from my book goes to nonprofits profits that are planting trees worldwide. The exhibition and book bring together photographs, installations, and sculptural works focused specifically on trees and forests that I've made over the past 40 years. Many of my earlier tree works that I've already shared today were included in the exhibition with a number of new works. Here's some of the uh, installation views of the exhibition. You can see when looking at my work that I tend to print small. Even though in today's photographic world, um, you have the opportunity to make very, very large photographs. And I don't do that for a couple of reasons. One is because I really want to create an intimate experience where someone has to get close to the photograph and take the time to look at it. Also, because I'm very conscious about using materials, wasting water, um, uh, all that goes into the production of, of making the work. So this is always an issue that I'm considering uh, in my work. You can see the, um, the sacred breath was, was shown. And you can see some of the trees and seedlings. The second prayer wheel titled Growing Air was included in the exhibition. The tree and uh, the Morse code on it is the word air. The tree is now planted and thriving on my land in Joshua Tree. A number of my works in the exhibition were new color photographs produced for this show, which I will now share with you. I'm getting close to the end here. For my photo project titled Growing Air, 
I returned to the planting sites of the seedlings in Holcomb Valley and the San Bernardino National Forest for the first time 25 years later in 2017 to find an extraordinarily beautiful and healthy forest of ponderosa pine trees inhabited by many species of wildlife. What you're looking at right now are all trees that I planted then 25 years ago. A few old structures and evidence of mining remain throughout the landscape. In this image, we see piles of pulverized gold ore with the forest in the background. Here, trees are growing in the tailing piles from the gold extractions. I am drawn to both what is visible and hidden and the hidden mysteries we seek to understand about trees and their communal lives. I'm spending time in the forest developing a meaningful connection and producing works that respond to this unique and complex environment. I especially delight in visiting the trees during the spring when the forest is in full bloom. I experience a deep and profound connection with the place and recognize the power and sacredness of the trees. I walk through the young forest attuned to the life force that surrounds me and the growing mycelian networks beneath my feet. I know that the trees are aware of my presence and I express gratitude for all they give us. These trees, like the millions of others that are being planted worldwide, are required to restore the breath of life to our dying planet. Another forest series was made during a visit to a coastal rainforest in British Columbia. The series titled Rebirth depicts new growth on old growth nurse stumps that were either cut from lumber or naturally fell. You may recall that this is the image on the cover of my book, Prana Life with Trees. The nurse stumps provide structure and nourishment for the young trees sharing nutrients, oxygen, and water to support new life. These dense forests are rich with oxygen providing the perfect forest bathing experience, which is proven to boost the immune system, lower blood pressure and aid sleep. Being in these healthy forests gives me a sense of hope and calm as I breathe in the power of the energy of nature. A few more of these images. My art, life, my art life practice has evolved over the years from a solitary one to a collaborative integrative practice of art making, exhibiting, writing, lecturing and teaching, community organizing and building and curating and activism as well. I realized that I am but one voice and that by bringing together artists, scientists, writers, and activists to share their varied creative perspectives and research-based findings has a greater and more substantial impact. Though retired for four years now from Cal State San Bernardino, I continue to teach workshops, lecture, and lead critiques through the Joshua Tree Center for Photographic Arts, which I founded in October 2019, and also on invitation from universities, nonprofits, and exhibition venues. Since July 2020, I've been hosting the monthly Eco Art Space Zoom program called Tree Talk, Artists Speak for Trees. Each month, I invite artists working in a range of media to share their artworks and ideas about these most essential and extraordinary living beings. Additionally, guest scientists and other professionals are invited to present their research, which contrib contributes profoundly to the dialogue. Curating and writing have been a significant part of my practice since the 80s. Researching exhibition themes and working with emerging and established artists that I respect is inspiring and broadens my perspective on a number of topics and critical issues. I have realized that bringing together very creative voices and visions on a subject enhances the audience experience and engagement. Writing has helped me to bring clarity and articulate my ideas about art, nature, built environments, philosophy, science, and much more. 
I am currently curating an exhibition and writing and editing a book about the unique and iconic Joshua Tree, which will be shown fall of 2024 at the Museum of Art and History in Lancaster, California, located in the west end of the Mojave Desert. The Joshua Tree's survival is threatened by climate change, development, and industrial solar and wind in the Mojave Desert, the sole habitat for this extraordinary being. California is currently considering Endangered Species Act protection for the Western Joshua Tree. Last week, the CESA Commission met and had a split vote on protection, leaving the Joshua Tree in limbo with temporary protection status until a final decision is made. I have been, I have been actively involved in efforts to protect Joshua Trees writing to the commission, sharing information with my network, and making a public comment to the commission last week. My curatorial project brings together prominent scientists focused on Joshua Tree research and diverse ideas and expressions by artists, writers, and conservationists that spotlight the endangered Joshua Tree and the vital and sensitive ecosystem that supports them. In conjunction with the exhibition, a conservation project is being planned for the reforestation of Joshua trees destroyed by fire in the Prime Desert Woodland Preserve in Lancaster. I also continue to make photo, photo works of young trees and ancient forests. I am con contributing my time, energy, and money to both local and worldwide tree planting and conservation efforts. I'm creating artworks and planting native trees with the hopes of inspiring positive, constructive, and peaceful action aimed at sustaining the breath of life on our planet and slowing or hopefully stopping climate collapse. I encourage each of you to plant trees at home or volunteer to plant locally or contribute to the nonprofits who are working to reforest our planet with billions of trees. We know that tree planting is critically important to heal the ecosystems that sustain our planet. I believe that the awareness that we are nature can profoundly transform our lives. When we realize that the water in our rivers and aquifers is the same water that flows through our bodies and the air we breathe is given to us by the forests and plants on the earth and in the oceans, we become partners with the natural world and live as conscious and compassionate beings. I thank you for this opportunity to share my ideas, my integrative art life and activism with all of you today. And I'm happy to take questions and engage in discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your rich story about your work and life. We're going to stop this recording right now and then resume with a new recording in just one moment. And Susan, maybe you'd like to help lead the question answer series. Should I remove the, should I stop sharing? I can do that. Uh, no, just, that's fine. We just, we'll stop the recording. Okay. Stop the recording, let's leave it or, there we go, that's good. <laughs>